Hello and welcome to another best of edition or episode of Back to Britpop. It's me, Chris. Uh, this is the third of four best of episodes that I've got planned. And I'm winding down season one of the podcast. And I'm going to take a little bit of a break. And then hopefully we'll come back in February or March time with a new season. Thanks again for all your support. I know I said it on the last episode, but it, I never thought or dreamt that I'd get the guests uh, that I've had on so far. It's been an absolute blast. So don't forget, follow me on the socials. Uh, just search for Back to Britpop on there. And if you want to support me financially, just go to my Ko-Fi page, which is in the show notes, and do like a buy me a coffee, £3 donation. That would also be ace. I think the first guest today is Rick McMurray of Ash. And the intro music's run out, which means I'm rambling too much. So, see you in a bit. You were signed to uh, Infectious, weren't you, in the end? Uh, yeah, Infectious yeah. Records. Um, what was that like? I mean, did, was there a moment when you kind of just looked at yourself and just each other, sorry, and just sort of thought, crikey, this is actually happening now, and the realisation yeah. set in? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was it was just like, wow, we've we've got a record deal. It's just insane. Is it? You know, it's like big kids, you know, and like putting out demo tapes and stuff like that, and getting excited. We also had parents going, you know, it's like, you know, like encouraging us not to forget about school and stuff like that, and going like, you know, it's like ninety percent of bands don't get signed, blah blah blah, and you know, it's just like, right, we've you know, proved them wrong. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You know, um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, that was that was great. I mean, I, I think you know, our our, ambi- our ambitions up to that time was to get a record deal and put a record out, and sort of we, we you know we did our I guess it was our first tour of of the UK. I think it was probably done. I guess it was Easter holidays. I got went on the mainland mainland UK, and off the back of that, we got we got record company interest and then a few months later we went back and that's when we signed the deal, you know, a couple of months later. So it was just like, it was like, you know, this is amazing, but it's like, it just, it just happened like quickly. You know what I mean? It, was, mm-hmm. it wasn't like, you know, we, we, we were out doing our first tour and just having the time of our lives and, and, and we got a record deal. Yeah. As well, so. Were you not really able to sort of at the time, I guess, oh, I get looking back on it. You, you you're kind of thinking, you, you maybe you weren't able to sort of sit back and take stock of what was physically happening. It was just sort of you were you were just going with the flow in in, in some way. Kind of, yeah. I mean, like, uh, Tav, our manager, was you know he he was great because he, he we got the, the sort of first single and it was just like felt like we we sort of got our foot in into the music industry with him, and then he obviously knew record company people and it was just sort of. Yeah, he'd sort of you know talk to us. You know, we got we got these people coming down tonight and stuff. And there's a there's a couple of labels coming down. And yeah, we yeah we I think we got we got the right one. But it was uh, mm. I, I don't know if like part of it felt like okay, it's like you know, well we got we got our first single out, so this is obviously logically the next step. And it's like great, and it just it just kind of kept rolling every every time we. It kinda, I think in the early days it felt like every time we sort of did something, something better would happen. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Do the single, and then we tour, and we get record company interest, and then we sign the deal, and then we make a record, and then we put out a single. And I think I think it was like our, once we signed the record deal, I think our first our first sing, single on the record record label, uh, which was Petrol, went to number one in the indie charts, and it was just like, okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, <laughs> it was like it just. It almost felt like we couldn't do any wrong, to be honest. And were you finding it difficult to write songs for the follow-up? I mean, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but you, you know, you had the whirlwind of 1977 touring relentlessly. That and just obviously that would have been an absolute grinder of a schedule for you. I'm guessing for three years. Even uh, even just to, just to rewind a bit, I think writing 1977 was pretty. Pretty weird, <laughs> weird time because obviously we we done trailer and we kind of like used up all our songs from from the demos apart from Girl from Mars, which was one that we kept in, we purposely kept that in the back pocket. It was like trailer was to kind of that was to sort of go out and introduce herself to to the world, yeah, kind of thing. And you know we're still at school at this point as well, so it was it was like you know limited touring little bits and pieces but Girl From Mars was kept in the back pocket and then and then I guess you know 
once that came out, that then we were we were kind of doing the touring, touring, like international touring of trailer, like at that point because we'd been in school up to then. So it was it was kind of a weird, a little bit of a weird way to do things. But having having girl from Mars kept back, that was like that was the kind of this this stroke of genius, and that kind of coincided with our you know our most commercial release with with us being able to go out and just tour as much as we we wanted so that was great but then we were kind of like we you know kung fu go from mars angel interceptor which were written at that point and the rest of rest of that was either written on like in i don't know like japan in hotel rooms or in australia somewhere or on tour in america or written in the studio i think i think we did like, in between touring and going into i think i think we'd like maybe december to do to do a bit more writing before we went into the studio to like I think we went in in on the second of Jan first or second of January, nineteen ninety six to start recording and you know we we had a few ideas sort of kicked into shape and we'd done some a little bit of pre production with Owen Morris but there was there wasn't there wasn't an album worth of material at that point and it was yeah. like a, it was quite you know it was it was quite a learning curve just being in the studio and it was it was pretty intense like trying to write and trying to trying to record all this stuff stuff yeah. at the same time so yeah was any pressure regist- registering with you guys at that point or were you just like still euthoric about what was happening yeah i mean i think i think well probably probably for tim like towards towards the end of the album i remember like Owen at one point saying like we need one more song and like tim sort of like having to disappear and he's like i've come up with this and that was uh lost in you which is an absolute corker of a song so mm. But he was like, I think, I think around that time he kind of thrived in the pressure, and I think there was like a really good, I guess, feedback loop between us, like you know, releasing singles, and sort of getting press, and like everything kind of going well, and just the you know the excitement of the newness, newness of everything, and it, it just you know really boosted our confidence, and we felt you know that almost like everything was there for the taking. You were kind of touring with some big acts as well across the state. So we have Weezer, you, you were supporting. That must have been like quite a, an interesting time as well to get some uh, like feedback from them, I guess, because they were doing extremely well at the time as well. Yeah, well, I think I, I, I really, it's, it's one thing I really remember is uh, uh, Rivers would, uh, I think there was a lot of tension within Weezer at that point. And Rivers would always, often come out and hang out with us in our dressing room. Um, because he's you know he's a, he's obviously he's a, he's a very shy individual but you mm. know he's like eventually he'd open up a little bit and he was just just fascinated by um in particular goldfinger and just the the chords in there because you know he'd, he'd gone to uh, he, he went to music college after the first album and they studied and stuff and he and he was just going like how do you how do you write chords like that and how do you put it together and just it's like Every time I write something, it's just like really obvious chords, and I try to do all, uh, I try and do stuff that's a bit weird, but it never works. And yeah, it's just like that. Was, that was quite mad having him just like <laughs> dissecting. <laughs> and Tim's just like I don't know, just like I just kind of played it and it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like the funky days, back again. Regards to like labels and things, and if you if you went necessarily looking to get signed or is it something that you you just thought might go hand in hand with you know, playing live and, and sort of you know letting uh, distributing your music to to fans was it always something you were conscious about you know chasing a label deal or or were you wanting to do this professionally not not really no um I mean, what was exciting about Ouija records was that two weeks before that we were reading about Riot Girl, and um, they were the main English proponent for that kind of music. And two months before that, we were probably reading, well, I was reading um, England's Dreaming by John Savage, and two months before that, I was probably reading, um, well, I was reading uh, Hanif Karishi's um, The Budger of Suburbia. And so we got signed, and we were very happy about it because we, 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 we really liked the label. And within a few weeks of that, um, John Savage and Hanif Karishi were at our gigs. John Peel was at our gigs. So it was all, 
once it happened, it just went so fast and every day was very different. And again, there's not that much time to think about it. It just, just happened. You know, the famous sort of meeting with David Byrne. Did you, was you aware that he was sort of in the audience and uh, at that gig? Or, or did you, how did that come about, him sort of putting on his label? Well, actually, that was more con- convoluted than David. There was um, a Warner's a um, and person that had seen us, and he'd mentioned it to uh, Yale at uh, Luar Kebab. Uh, because he saw us as that kind of, well, he saw the more Asian element side of it and Luakabop being a little more um, uh, non-American based in their style. um, He thought that that would, uh, that that we would be right for them. And certainly Yale and Cat, the label, were the first people to uh, hope that that we'd we'd be on the label. Mm. David was actually, um, had to be persuaded gentle persuasion i think <laughs> from from that point on i mean well obviously before then you kind of you toured everywhere didn't you you were sort of uh, you went global uh, quite quickly are there any sort of festivals or uh, or gigs around the world that really stick out to you as being sort of you know head turners where you just just look at each other on stage and think you know what are we doing here <laughs> Probably not, actually. <laughs> when we when things really took off, we were on a different planet, really, um, because of the drugs and because of um, because of the pace of things and because of the the travel. You know, we're not a band that that has yearned to be on a stage. So being on a stage was something we didn't mind. But uh, you know, some bands going back to your first question in isolation will be very very frustrated because that's that's them that's what defines them we've never really yearned to be on a stage and we don't mind it and we certainly don't mind not doing it i i really i don't know i mean there were some sort of turning points like when we played the brooklyn uh, academy of music that was a turning point you knew that things were rather big um and also it, that was rather nice because New York had certainly taken us to their hearts and, and so had uh, lots of people in America. And we really didn't know what we would find in America, but we were pleasantly surprised that there were a lot of great forward thinking people that, that, that talked to us and actually talked to us very openly. Um, whereas in England, we've always struggled and going back to what you said about touring and going everywhere, we actually, we were, we were pushed out of England. We couldn't get arrested in England after a while. Uh, so we had no choice if we wanted to survive to go to mainland Europe. And uh, that's why we've always uh, got a love for, for the mainland Europe. Sleep on the left side, leave the right side free. What was the writing uh, process like for you on the road? If you, if, you know, obviously with, with majority of record labels and deals, they're always wanting you to produce the next album and to, to continue to you know to sell records did you find it quite difficult to to write in those situations or, or or did you have like plenty of stuff to sort of to use well there was a lot of ideas going about i mean, really i don't mean to be contrary but um labels never told us what to write and when to write them we told them what was going to go down um they didn't even know what the albums were until they were mastered and put put in front of them um we we we're not we've never been a group that has we've never had an a and r person and we've never wanted wanted one so you know that we've we've been very lucky in lots of respects and very unlucky in in, in lots of others but um a and r's are, are not one of them it's it's quite a different story for many bands, isn't it, in terms of ownership of the music and uh, not coming at it from that way. You must have felt quite liberated with other bands that were going through maybe different things at the time, or still do as well. Well, we still had our problems in terms of the length of um, copyright and um, and ultimately being on a label. Um, but when it came to what we did as a group, then then we had complete control but you see that that's the the paradox between being on an independent label because you want to be independent but there's also the other side of the coin which is 
you're on an independent label if you want to make it work you make it work yourself or you can just do one um and so we wanted to make it work so we put a hell of a lot of effort in before long we were doing we no one else could do press releases so we did our own press releases uh we wrote our own videos um all of a sudden we were doing the lot and um and that's why it's sort of taken its toll and that's why you see me as the uh, the cowering person that uh, stands mm. for you um <laughs> and that's why we're not calling anymore it's, it's kind of i guess in the early years it's, it's all you want to do isn't it it's, it's it's the passion and the hunger's there but then i suppose the corporateness of it all can be can be you know very contradicting to to what you what you want to do we never really saw any of the corporate stuff because we 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 were in our own bubble in that respect unfortunately mm. yeah there 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 we were on a label therefore um we uh, were subject to some of those laws and now we're on our own label and we have been since 2000 and uh, 2000 and something 2002 so the, and, that, and that obviously just lends itself to just pure sort of creative freedom doesn't it in terms of what you can do when you can do it um i know you said you had that already anyway which you're very lucky for um but england is a is a garden is uh is your is your latest record that you, you released uh, just this year um in terms of how that differs from you know the yeah. earlier the earlier albums you've released and other 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 recordings um was the writing process for that slightly different and what were you looking towards for kind of inspiration for sort of some of the content um well the writing of that was different in that normally i have a sketch of uh, ideas ready before doing songs um vocals or 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 um choruses or um other inspirations um Whereas this one, because I didn't have the vocals, because I wasn't feeling great at the time when we started, there was um, still a need to to record if any ideas came along musically. So I look at it as before it used to be you do the, uh, you, you first you do the brain and then you build the body around it. And this was the other way around. You, you, uh, you built the body and have to, unfortunately insert the uh, brain in afterwards so the the songs and the lyrics came, well the lyrics came in right right at the end because it took a lot lot longer to get to them and in terms of what we wanted for the album it was we wanted an album that was um, undeniable and that sort of uh, unwittingly to sort of put all our other albums into sort of perspective and it shows the game plan of every individual album and even in, even in the varieties of it. Yeah, we wanted every song to, to hit home. We wanted to um, really do our best with it. We did that before with uh, Hand Cream for a Generation. I think we, we, uh, we succeeded. I think um, with what we had to get with this album, I think we succeeded as well. We went for a more streamlined uh, approach as well less samples um, more musicality to get the the flow going even more than what we've had in the past and we wanted to some get something that was undeniable and I think that's what this album is and in terms of what's going on in the world there's, there's plenty of source material isn't there even to write about and to include in some of the, the subjects because there's always been uh a, a very clear political message as well with your music, which I think is really important now more than ever. Uh, well, I think so. I think, um, I think politically what we've done over the years actually makes even more sense now because um, one, because so few people have been political. We don't see political as a dirty word. We see it as mm. a very natural uh, thing and a natural expression of what's going on around you. Who wouldn't want to, uh, write about it and mm. who wants to write about boys and girls all, all, all the time um, but we do think that uh, that we we put over a politics that that uh, is is now 
has now come alive. I mean, with staging the playing of the race platform, there's mention of the precedence that you are against and consequence that it may all go wrong. I don't think that's been ever more true. Mm. Um, but it, the whole albums, every album is pickled with, uh, with elements like that. And um, um, we're, we're very happy to do that. Um, I was going to ask you really, in terms of picking up an instrument and, and sort of writing lyrics and, or, or just the writing process in general, when did that kind of start happening for you? Well, I, I guess um, uh, me and John from the band obviously being brothers um, and therefore having to grow up in the same house, we were, uh, as soon as, yeah, as soon as there was any music in the house, like my mum, our mum uh, is a music teacher and sort of, so there was always records in the house. Uh, it was lots of sixties records, and just basically we were given a box of seven inches, like very early on, and one of those old dance set style record players. Uh, and so we'd just go through all our mum's records, and we knew which ones we liked. And then because we had to share a room for so long as well, um, and then the early eighties. I mean, I don't, like I was only be five or whatever, but I just remember being mad and Adam and the Ants, and just you know we would just listen to those records over and over again. Um, and so, so yeah, basically me and John just were forced into having the same influences. Weirdly, the 60s records that we we kind of absorbed the most out with the Beatles would be really weird things like Pictures of Matchstick Men, the status quo was on all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Voodoo Child, Jimi Hendrix, and then just some mad stuff that Apple had released, like, you know, kind of uh, like Raga, as in with 1G, uh, like... <laughs> Buddhist chant records and whatnot. There's, you know, when the uh, Kula Shaker came out with Govinda, it was like, no, no, we've uh, we've we've got this '70s <laughs> record that's uh, the Govinda Jaya Jaya one. But for whatever reason, we listen to that all the time. So, um, but in terms of actually making music, I think maybe for my like tenth birthday or something, we we got a Casio keyboard, which had inbuilt rhythms and kind of like preset chords. Uh, so you would hit one one key and it would you know, you'd hit A and it would play an A major chord with a rhythm attached. And so I, we would just mess about with that. Probably, yeah, but, you know, late 80s would just be trying to basically work out how New Order songs worked. And then John maybe got a guitar when he was eight or nine. Um, and so, yeah, we were just, I, I don't really remember. There's lots of, there's some hilarious tapes that are marked this 1988 and it's just <laughs> like <laughs> very primitive songs mostly called things that sound like new order songs um but then anyway fast track not even that much but yeah we got a proper drum machine we got a rolling drum machine in about 1990 and I, as i said just spent ages trying to copy 808 state drum beats and so uh in the in very very early 1991 me and john and i was i was at 14 and john was 11 and we went into a proper recording studio um having kind of rehearsed in the same place for a good year before that and we in a day we recorded a three-track demo <laughs> i'm not too proud to admit that the main song was called marmalade skies and i'm sure i've heard that lyric in someone's <laughs> song before um, but basically sounded like it sounded a bit like definitely all the vocals are tim burgess inflected and the the drum program and is total, total the shaman i just ripped off the shaman's drum beats as well it sounds like progen or something so, uh, so that'll be thirty years old, as of uh, March next year. So, so yeah, we we kind of we were a little bit uh, we were young stars uh, in the <laughs> Glasgow scene, <laughs> and the guys that run the studio in the rehearsal room were just would just marvel at our at, like uh, commitment to it and just how loud we like to play. Um, so we were we, me and John have been well known in the Glasgow music scene since the very early nineties. Uh, it just took us a good while to actually chance upon a sound that actually got us somewhere so um, yeah but yeah yeah that that demo is hilarious maybe one day we'll uh, <laughs> dig it out i've got a dat tape right in front of me you're going to re-release it and, and then tour it i think i think when this all kind of dies down i think so yeah just that one <laughs> song over and over again in various forms <laughs> yeah. so you did eventually become a, a free piece obviously with with yeah. manda but what she was slightly younger than you the same age as john is that right or she's in between me and john so ah, okay um, yeah basically Amanda was the only other person at our school that was remotely into 
any indie music at all. Um, or at least that's what it felt like. She would, me and John would do gigs at school, just the two of us, and she was kind of the only person that would enthusiastically attend. And so early 1993, we all went together, all underage, admittedly. We all went together, and the first band we ever saw live together, all three of us, was Swede at the Glasgow Plaza, which yeah, um, yeah. Bore, bore, uh, bore no resemblance to the music they ended up making. But, um, yeah, we just kind of, like, started hanging out. Uh, me and Amanda started going out as a couple, and so we were pretty much, like, hanging about. I'd be hanging about with Amanda all day, and then <laughs> sometimes John would get to sort of uh, join in the music thing. Uh, <laughs> and Amanda, Amanda wasn't really wanting to be involved or anything but just the more we listened to records and then we would just we would mess about with a four track uh, tape recorder and, and uh, up in my room and she would mess about with a guitar and then came up with this really you know just classic straightforward punk riff which I was just like oh that's brilliant let's make a song out of that and that that became Kill Your Boyfriend and that was genuinely the first song that Amanda had written it was just like just the chord sequence, I put a riff on it, we recorded it, and then, yeah, Amanda just wrote down some quick words, recorded it, um, and somehow, and I still don't know how this happened, uh, but very quickly, it got played on Radio Scotland, and I was like, I still don't know how somebody got that tape, I don't remember, like, handing it out to too many people, it was still a little bit of a kind of like, well, this is a bit funny, and uh, it was really rough, and it's, um, but it sounded really great on the radio, and uh, so I think that gave us confidence to just kind of go a bit more um, musically of your know, route where we were shouting a bit more. Uh, the Riot Girl influence was kind of brought to the fore, but but all our kind of more traditional classic guitar pop, synth pop sort of influences were still there as well. And we that's, yeah, we just kind of, we sort of facilitated to do what we accidentally ended up doing, which was kind of scattershot approach. But, um, but yeah, that's how it happened really. in those early sort of gigs and those early sort of studio times you were having together was there any point where you thinking hang on we've got something here this this could actually go quite far well i don't know about going, going quite far but yes we definitely thought that we've we've, we've hit on something here something we ne- didn't necessarily have with the previous band because i think we're so busy trying to be like um different all the time that we forgot to be familiar once we realized that we had to cl- uh, cloak it in a familiarity then we realised we had something, yeah. So when did things start happening then? Do you do you remember a certain time when you started to get label interest and A&R guys coming to gigs? Oh, well, it, was, it was kind of weird for us because uh, we were kind of, in, we felt like we were in a void for a long time. In fact, in fact, it got to the point where we were thinking, this isn't happening. We're, we're just, we're not playing to anyone. There's no, no one ever came to our gigs. And we're thinking, what, we'd written a lot of songs and, Nothing, nothing was happening for us, but uh, uh, it was actually one evening um, we played at the, the Mean Fiddler in Halston, and there was two people in the audience, and one of them was our neighbour. Um, and there was another band on the same, same night called Badge, and they were from Oxford. They were like a young band from Oxford. And they absolutely loved us and said, oh, can we buy your record? And we're like, well, we, don't, we haven't got a record. And they couldn't believe it. We hadn't ever got a record because we so, you know, they thought we were so good. And they said, well, we've got a bit of a following in Oxford. Why don't you come and play with us in Oxford? You'd you know, get to play to people. So we'd, we actually thought nothing of it, thinking they'd never get back in touch, but they did. And we played a, a gig in, at a point in Oxford, um, supporting them, and it was absolutely packed in there because they were quite a popular band in Oxford. I think at that point, we kind of took off a little bit. There was a, there was a, 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 a murmuration going around. Well, there's this band, you know, and people started talking about us. I think it sort of started from there. It was probably about 96, and that started happening. When did Nude come knocking on the door then? Because there's a guy that was at the point uh, that saw, saw us that, that talked to Steve Sutherland from NME about it, sort of mentioned us to, to him. And then they had that NME band, new band showcase, so they asked people to send tapes into the to an NME. So we sent a tape in, and they picked it up out of the bag and thought, oh, I know, I know I've heard this band, you know, this mm. guy was talking talk about. So it gave us an advantage, I guess, when they put put the, put the record on, you know. So uh, they, they asked us to play that, and I think the, the day after we played that gig, 
that's when the phone calls started happening from record companies, basically. Was it kind of like a, a relief for you as well as, obviously it was a quite, ex- must have been an exciting time, but you were you all relieved that you were being taken seriously after that sort of? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that we ever thought we were to be taken serious, but I think we just thought it was hilarious. It, for the, I wish I must have spent six months just laughing, thinking, surely they got the wrong people here, you know? <laughs> this isn't really part of the plan, but, you know, it was fun. So what happened? Were you, were you put into studio time to record with the producer initially? What kind of conversations were taking place about, you know, how that record was going to be recorded? Uh, uh, well, you know, there was a little bit of a problem with nude records because we wanted to make a triple album. And they were basically saying, you're a, you're a, you're a first band doing their first album. You're not that well known. You can't be doing a triple album as your first album. Come on. <laughs> So we're like, well, how about a double? <laughs> <laughs> Can we make it down to a double? <laughs> I don't know. Because we were thinking, this isn't going to last very long. We need to get everything into one album, uh, everything picture. We were, we were thinking, we're not going to last too long, so let's try and get you know get it all down. So um, unfortunately, we'd, ha- we'd actually signed a re- very good record like record deal. Well, sorry, very good for us, in that we, mm. got all the, we got all the say, basically. Whatever we said, the record company had to do, So, which is, which is kind of unfortunate, because most bands aren't in that position. Most bands, there's a compromise between what the record company wants and what you want. Yeah, yeah. But in our, in our case, we could do what the hell we wanted. So if we wanted a triple album, we would have made a triple album. But I think we made a kind of a compromise, because Saul and you went, oh, you know, it's going to be a bit, bit of a push to sell that so we're, okay we'll make it a double were you were you quite put, like tenacious with that then would you was it something you were really definitely were quite dead set on doing i know because i've read a lot about the third like the three album idea um because mm. w- with your i guess your influences as well that would definitely have fitted in with kind of the soundscapes that you were creating and your influences in terms of that prog rock feel um yeah. almost like a like a trilogy it's something that, that isn't necessarily done even nowadays is it really either yeah. I wouldn't say tenacious, I would say pig-headed. That's basically what we were. Um, it was probably not the best of ideas, but, you know, it's kind of like, well, we're not necessarily making it for now. We're not making it for the, you know, that the mid-90s period. We're making it for, like, 20 years' time or for 50 years' time when someone discovers it, you know, when it, when it becomes a thing. Like most of my favourite albums, like Trump S Replica by Captain Beefheart, wasn't really appreciated for 20 years. At the time, and Velvet Underground as well, they weren't really, they weren't, they didn't sell that much and they weren't regarded very highly amongst the kind of like, you know, normal world. Mm. But gradually over time, these things have taken on a kind of like a legendary status. And that, I suppose that was kind of the idea. You know, it's not necessarily, we're not necessarily making this record for now, we're making it for you know, the future, future generations. With the live shows then um, going hand in hand with like the first release of the album, we obviously started to get a sort of a, a big, almost like a cult following as well, I guess, because it's just how different you were and how kind of refreshing you were to the scene. Did you feel that, um, you know, your fans were obviously going with you on that journey as well? Well, we're making, we're sort of making new fans just because we were in the press a lot and the press the people were interested. They'd never, never actually heard us, and there still wasn't the internet then, so people didn't get a chance to hear you mm. until the record or they went to see you live. So there was a lot of hype about us, and unfortunately, with hype, and I'm I'm guilty of this as well. When I see a band that's hyped, I immediately think they're going to be rubbish. And a lot of people did come along to our gigs thinking we were going to be rubbish because it's another enemy hype, you know. But fortunately, uh, most of the time, people went away impressed. I think that is something that that was kind of special. I felt, mm. I felt live, we were, we were kind of special anyway. Did you, um, the, did you always get on with the press? Uh, yeah, well, the, well, with the enemy, I, re- I do remember a time we were trying to get our, our album recorded and we we're trying to find the time to do that. And we'd just done this tour with Travis, uh, just before the Christmas of 97 or 8? 97, I think. Um, 
and the enemy wanted us to play on the enemy brat bus tour uh, and so I, I remember having a, having a phone conversation with someone at the enemy and uh, just basically saying look it's, we can't do it because we've got we've got an album to record and we just don't have the time to do it and he did he did start threatening me saying um well, basically, so we made you, and we can break you. <laughs> uh, so I just put the phone down on him, basically. Um, but until, until that point, we had quite a good relationship. 